Welcome everybody to our webinar today, uh, which is an oil and gas market update. I want to thank everyone for spending time with us today. Uh, these have obviously been interesting times in the oil and gas industry. While our firm and our attorneys are experts in oil and gas law, we are by no means experts in the oil and gas markets. So uh, we've asked Josh Young to speak with us today and share his knowledge as he so uh, gracefully does in news and on, and on the internet all the time of uh, what's going on in the oil and gas markets. So Josh is the founder and chief investment officer of Bison Interests, which is a Houston-based investment firm focused on publicly traded oil and gas companies. Bison Interests was shortlisted in two categories by Hedgeweek US Best Equity Hedge Fund under 500 million and Best Long Biased Equity Hedge Fund. Josh was the only oil and gas investment manager to be selected as a Heart Energy 40 under 40 recipient and his incredible outperformance in 2021 of 390% was featured in Barron's Investor Showcase. Congratulations, Josh. I know it's been quite a run for you. He was previously chairman of the board of Ironbridge Resources, which is a publicly traded Canadian E&P, which he took control of, sold off non-core assets, and sold for a premium. And prior to founding Bison, Josh was an energy investor at a hedge fund and a multi-billion dollar family office, an investment analyst at a private equity fund, and a management consultant. Josh's commentary and ideas are regularly sought after by journalists, and he's been featured in places such as Reuters, The Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and The Financial Times. You can follow Josh on Twitter, where he regularly hosts Twitter spaces about the oil and gas industry. Do you have anything that you want to go over with the disclaimer, Josh? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So no, this uh, this disclaimer is important. Um, uh, securities are uh, highly regulated, and none of this is an offering. Um, the goal here, like Zach was saying, is just to to offer some educational uh, perspectives and insights. And uh, you know, really, no one knows the future. But what we found is that by trying to clearly understand the present. Uh, we may have a little bit of an advantage in um, having a, a educated perspective on what may what may happen in the future. So any any sort of return data or anything like that, uh, please view with caution. And the goal here is to establish credibility and then uh, show sort of uh, a baseline of what's happening and then uh, some perspective on what may happen next. Um, so a uh, little bit about uh, about me and about Bison, uh, which Zach actually already went through, so we can uh, we can go past that. So so just a, a, a minute about Bison and sort of um, what we've done from a public perspective. Um, so in media like this and on TV, we've talked about a few different publicly traded oil and gas companies uh, that have done quite well. This is versus XOP, which is an investable. ETF that invests in publicly traded oil and gas companies and is sort of an alternative as a, a mechanism for getting exposure to the space. So uh, companies that we've discussed in the last uh, couple of years have done quite well versus the XOP. And that's important from a macro perspective because macro insights are helpful in selecting individual securities and uh, the ability to select individual securities that outperform versus the market is indicative, I think, of some uh, additional perspective or valuable perspective from a macro perspective. And then also just Bison has done quite well. Um, again, none of this is an offering and um, it's actually sort of exciting to be able to show this. Uh, <laughs> we changed our securities registration to be able to, to talk about our performance. Um, again, none of this, this is not indicative, um, but the idea is that, hey, we might know a little bit about the oil and gas market if we're able to, to do this. And one other thing just to note on this, um, oil and gas stocks for many years were actually materially underperforming the broader market and interestingly, over the last three years, XOP has actually outperformed the market by a little bit. So that's a note written on this. So when you think about oil and gas, and particularly oil, and you hear uh, various uh, commentaries, and actually just before this, I saw the, the Reuters daily update, and uh, you know the, the headline is oil prices down on recession uh, and recession fears. And so um, every time I see recession in the context of stocks, as well as in the context of the oil market, I think of Peter Lynch, who 
earned way above market returns for the entirety of his management in uh, Fidelity, where he ran the Magellan Fund. And um, it's pretty interesting because uh, Peter Lynch actually underperformed in downturns, uh, but in aggregate over, what was it, 30 years, he did twice as well as the stock market. And his perspective is that far more money has been lost by investors trying to anticipate corrections than has been lost in all the corrections combined. So when you think about recession risk, you think about the risk of actually um, experiencing a recession uh, for your business, for individual securities, um, just you know, there, there's a lot of crying wolf in the financial media and in the broader uh, news. Um, and the reality is that most of the th most of the time things do well, and that by being afraid and avoiding activity because of fear of recession, you can actually miss out on a lot more than you would experience if you just engaged in business and investments and experience those recessions as they come. Yes. So um, the oil market is. Uh, is pretty pretty interesting here. Um, the uh, speculative positioning in oil futures is extremely low, despite the oil price being relatively high versus where it's been over the last five to seven years. And so, low open interest is um, you know it's indicative of poor sentiment. It's indicative of very little money being invested. And there's a lot of upside potential in this. If you if you take away one thing from this talk you can think about how little is invested that's that has oil close to $80 a barrel right now. And so if you get back to just sort of normal open interest levels, you can see oil prices rebound really substantially. And again, when you get back to those sort of recession concerns, it appears that there's a lot of fund flows away from oil because of concern of recession, sort of independent of the supply and demand dynamics of the industry and of the commodity. And so when you when you experience that normalization, which I expect to happen over time, and it's hard to know exactly when that will happen, as that normalization plays out, there's a reasonable expectation that prices may rise substantially from here, just as you see this uh, net positioning uh, rebound. Where did those investors go? Um, this is net positioning, so oh, it's okay. actually people uh, selling their long positions and in some cases uh, betting against it, shorting it. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, their, their uh, gross exposure is probably lower. Uh -huh. Their overall exposure is lower, uh -huh. and they've tilted negative over positive. <laughs> so, uh, holistically, from an oil market perspective, one of the biggest drivers of the market on a multi-year basis is capital invested. The more money that's spent, the more oil supply over time. The less money that's spent, the less supply over time. If you look at this time frame that we're showing from 2014 to 2022, and you look back at the prior period, you would see a increasing amount of capital spent, and you would see an amount spent on an inflation-adjusted basis that's well in excess of what's been spent over the last roughly seven or eight years. And so what we need is a period after this dramatic drop in capital spend, uh, increased capital spend in order to get oil supply uh, healthy again and to increase supply sufficiently to be able to adequately supply the market um, and adequately supply growing demand. So after a long period of falling and low capital investment, it's reasonable to expect higher prices that will incentivize a period of higher than historical capital spend. So we're sort of at the tail end of that low capital spend and we're seeing um, capital start to increase again. And that's promising because again, it took many years of underspend to sort of clear the market and it's gonna take many years of outspend to swamp the market. Um, Josh, I read recently that um, CEO, uh, compensation and incentive programs in the upstream space have changed from, you know, at the beginning of the shale boom, they were production volume focused, and now they seem to have shifted in some companies to uh, a focus largely on uh, returning capital to shareholders. So how do you think that that will affect the underinvestment and the investment that's needed? So there's been a really remarkable shift in the industry where both from an incentives perspective, incentive comp perspective, and um, from a 
sort of uh, push from investors. We, we've seen capital spend fall dramatically relative to cash flow, um, but that's really not that different from past cycles around this part, this part of the cycle. Mm. You, you see, you see a lot of rationalization at the sort of bottom or near the bottom of past cycles. You see a lot of consolidation, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so, you know, it feels very different because it's radically different from what we saw around, let's say, 2010 and five years around that in either direction. Um, but just because it's different from that period doesn't make it that different from what it might have looked like in the year 2000 or 1998 or something like that, sort of at the the early start of the last uh, bull market for oil. So, oh, so it is noteworthy, um, but I think it's more noteworthy in terms of its similarity to prior periods that were very promising for the oil and gas industry um, than it is for being totally novel. Okay. Thanks for clearing that up. So again, uh, we need more money to get spent in order to get more development, in order to have more oil supply on a sustainable basis. And so you can see here that historically, oil prices and rig counts have been highly correlated. And we've seen a disconnect where oil prices have risen substantially relative to the rig count. Um, I do think over time that we'll see this converge. And I think what we're going to need to see is oil prices much higher to essentially drag the rig count back up. There is an argument that uh, that wells are more productive and rigs are more efficient today than they were, let's say, five years ago or 10 years ago. And there is some truth to that argument, but there's also sort of a difficulty curve. So people understand this these days because of Bitcoin and certain other things where they understand that every 18 months or two years, uh, your Bitcoin miner um, gets half as productive because there are so many uh, miners trying to mine for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So in a similar way, uh, for oil, the easiest oil to find and produce has already been found and produced. And so every year, as you drill for oil, you're drilling less productive uh, fields. And so even if your rig gets more efficient, um, your actual oil production per rig may not rise. And in many prior periods, the production per rig has actually fallen. So what we experienced with the last oil bust was there was a huge boom in rig productivity, and that was driven by uh, horizontal drilling and multi-stage frack technology, and that was mostly experienced in the U.S. and Canada. Um, we're seeing productivity improvements uh, having fallen dramatically, and we're actually starting to see, at least in some cases, rigs getting less productive uh, in terms of oil production per rig running, incremental oil production per rig running uh, attributable within the first year of that rig having run. Because the projects are more difficult? Yeah, because the projects are more difficult because there are only so many of the very, very best wells that you can drill in Southeast New Mexico and West Texas and South Texas and various other places. So if you had 5,000 of the very best Permian wells to drill, and you've drilled 20,000 Permian wells already, uh, horizontal, multi-stage, um, similar for Eagleford. If you had 5,000 of the very best Eagleford wells, and you've drilled 10 or 20,000 there as well, I mean, at some point, you've depleted all your best inventory or much of your best inventory, and you start to drill your tier two, your tier three, et cetera. And so even if you're really efficient with that, um, you end up with less uh, production per rig. And then the reality is that as the rig count starts uh, tipping back up, you end up with more sort of new people on the rigs and it mm -hmm. takes a while for those people to get sure. up to speed. And then there's also uh, turnover across the industry. And so you have more new people on new rigs and more new people on old rigs. Right. And that hurts the actual sort of uh, number of feet of well drilled per day. Hmm. How, and I don't mean to get us off track, but I just had a question. When operators and EMP companies are looking at their reserves, um, and they have, you know, a lot of operators have significant inventory, how do they calculate the cost of inventory that might not be drilled for 10 years or 20 years, if it's like the most difficult projects that they have? So, so there are SEC rules around um, booking of crude reserves. Uh -huh. And so typically, if it's not in your capital budget within the first five years, uh, it's not going to show up in your approved reserves. Oh, okay. So 
you may claim it as inventory, but you're typically not, it's typically not in that proof reserve value or proof reserve quantity. Gotcha. So, um, but it is relevant, right? Because you look at companies that claim 10 years or 20 years or whatever of inventory. And the reality is that the back half of that inventory is almost always substantially worse mm -hmm. than the front half. Right. And it's sort of this, um, you know, for a while, industry didn't really want to talk about it. People, I think, are much more open about it now. Um, you see it with higher natural gas production versus oil in mm -hmm. fields, and you also see it just in, in some of the productivity curves. Gotcha. I didn't know if there was a rule of thumb, like, you know, with technology and semiconductor chips, for example, like the price reduces by half every year or whatever, mm -hmm. even the technological improvements. I didn't know if there was a similar back of the envelope calculation for difficult acreage that isn't going to be drilled for 20 years. Yeah, I don't think there's a Miller's law for uh, for uh, tier two or tier three uh, oil fields. Okay, called Josh's law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. So, so one of the big things um, that happened last year that I think surprised people, including me, was how how thoroughly China locked down their economy and locked down their country. And when you look at um, Chinese. Uh, oil consumption over time, it's mostly been, if you look at it from the year 2000 to 2022, you know, consumption was was rocketing higher from 4.7 million barrels a day to, it was projected to get to 16.4 million barrels a day. And we missed that by a few million barrels a day for 2022. So that was a big surprise. And while everyone was focused on Russia and potential supply disruptions, China was not so quietly uh, shutting down their country in an attempt at sort of uh, zero COVID policy, um, which failed. And so what we're seeing right now is that uh, many analysts and sort of the, the general consensus, the EIA, IEA, et cetera, they're all sort of projecting that China rebounds their consumption slightly from 2022 levels. But our view is that actually the baseline is the appropriate baseline is not um, 2022, the appropriate baseline is to look at the longer run trajectory of consumption. And we think it's reasonable to expect that China will resume their demand growth on a path that incorporates their demand path uh, prior to COVID. So hmm. I don't think it's so unreasonable to think, hey, maybe they don't fully recover, but maybe they'll get 2 million barrels a day or 3 million barrels a day more demand than they had in 2022. And, and that's very different from when you look at the IEA and EIA estimates. It's actually incidentally more similar to what OPEC is forecasting. And that could have something to do with conversations between China and Saudi Arabia about probably likely consumption of oil in 2023. Yeah. So um, I, think, I think it's always, uh, people always think that their experiences are different and unique. And the reality is that as humans, we all have a lot in common. And uh, just like in the US after um, COVID restrictions were lifted, people engaged in what's now called revenge travel. People went on mm -hmm. extra trips, extra flights, extra road trips, et cetera. Um, in China, where the zero COVID policies were even more extreme, there's a reasonable expectation that there will be sort of even more uh, travel, even more road trips and so on. We're already seeing it in terms of domestic flight recoveries where the data is very promising, even though people are actually quite sick right now because they they uh, ripped the Band-Aid off the zero COVID policies. Mm -hmm. So um, also one other interesting thing, there is sort of this misconception around China uh, Chinese real estate, their market is very uh, troubled, but Chinese consumers actually have excess savings. Mm. And I forget which uh, sources, but there were news China reports. China has the highest savings. savings rates in the world. That's right. Yeah. And they actually boosted that substantially over the last couple of years. Mm. So uh, they, the Chinese consumer has a lot of money, and they, in some cases, just emerged from a situation where their physical there were physical weldings on their apartment uh, complexes where they were not able to emerge. So uh, I, I think it's reasonable to expect there there may be some significant revenge travel. And again, it's not all about what's the consumption going to be in China as much as what's it going to be in China, and then when someone gets on a plane from Beijing or Shanghai and flies to uh, Bangkok or flies to Milan or whatever. What, 
what are they going to consume while they're there mm -hmm. and how much incremental consumption is there going to be across various oil intensive economic activities. And so I think we could end up seeing a substantial surprise to the upside in 2023 oil demand. And it doesn't seem like I mean, when you look at this, um, it really should not be that much of a surprise. So if you're in the People's Republic, just get out there and spend that money. Well, I don't think they need to be told that. I think they're already doing it. Yeah. Um, and that's actually one of the other really interesting things. We, we thought about putting a whole bunch of slides in here about China. And um, one of the other things to look at is that Chinese stimulus has mostly been tilted towards um, the development of cities and really the development of speculative uh, housing. Um, as that stimulus shifts, there's a reasonable expectation that it will shift towards uh, facilitating purchase of cars and facilitating purchase of other large ticket non real estate items, most of which are manufactured in China. So mm -hmm. it sort of can help uh, sustain the manufacturing base as Europe goes through a difficult time and as the US may or may not be entering a recession. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that that happens, that could really dramatically increase uh, the Chinese economy, mm -hmm. right? The actual, their GDP measure could rise substantially from that, um, as well as the oil intensity of their economy. Mm -hmm. Real quick, do you know what, uh, what percentage of, of Chinese energy consumption is still coal? I don't know that offhand, but it is pretty substantial. Pretty substantial. And I think actually they're using more coal than their statistics are showing. Oh. It's unfortunate for uh, air quality in right. China. Uh, but, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty interesting. Oh, and they did also lift their import ban on Australian coal recently. So, um, yeah, I think they're, they're tilting towards more fossil fuel consumption, not less. And it is interesting, their public statements are that they're, they're engaging in the energy transition and they are building a lot of electric vehicles. Um, but even though they're making those public statements, uh, Buffett likes to say, uh, ignore what people say mm -hmm. and focus on what they do. And what they're doing is including um, now importing Australian coal, despite a multi-year dispute with Australia. That is great. Yep. Well, it is uh, it is something. I don't know if it's <laughs> great or terrible. Um, so uh, when we look at the oil market, we try to think about the, the long term demand and supply trajectory. Um, the capital cycle is among the most important inputs. Uh, the demand trajectory is also, I think, important and similar to the argument I was making about Chinese demand. I think it's reasonable to think about the long run uh, trajectory of world oil demand. And there were actually some great charts that, that came out recently. Um, I think I remember uh, Andorand uh, shared one, um, and there were a couple other folks that, that shared some really interesting perspectives where in historical downturns for oil demand, you saw recoveries at a faster trajectory than the prior oil demand growth trajectory. So essentially when you try to suppress oil demand or when the economy suppresses oil demand through a recession, um, through lockdowns, through whatever, you actually end up resetting on a higher growth trajectory afterwards. And so when we think about this, we think about this sort of 1% plus world oil demand growth trajectory that the world has experienced for about 40 years. And again, that's not it's not perfectly linear. And when there's been downturns that have affected it, it's actually sent oil uh, demand growth rates up uh, much more uh, for periods after. And so what we're seeing is there was a little bit of an oversupply in 2022, again, entirely and then some driven by uh, China zero COVID policies, right? If you look at that 1.2 million barrels a day of oversupply, and you consider the prior chart that showed a 3 million barrel a day demand loss in China, you know, you're looking at roughly 1.8 million barrel a day under supply if China had not been shut down for zero COVID. Yeah. So here we are in um, here we are in 2023, and there's a reasonable expectation of let's say roughly two million barrels a day of deficit, likely tilted towards the second half as China. Uh, we don't expect the reopening to be perfectly sort of linear um, after. Uh, Chinese New Year's, there's a decent chance that there'll be a little bit of a slowdown. Um, and, you know, with going from zero COVID to um, fully reopen, there, there are these sort of waves of illness that, that are being experienced that are affecting demand a little. But 
ultimately what we're seeing is that demand is recovering. It's recovering faster than projections, uh, which is similar to what happened in prior periods where demand was suppressed and supply. There's just not enough investment in uh, sustaining the world oil supply. We need more investment and we need it to happen over a multi-year period. Hmm. What happens if that underinvestment continues? Uh, the less you invest, the less you produce, the less you produce, um, the less is available for consumption. And so what you have happen, and this hasn't happened very often in the oil market mm -hmm. because producers really like to produce. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's just this tendency, uh, there's the overwhelming urge for people that have the ability to drill wells to go drill more wells. Uh, so, you know, the, you, you mentioned the prefer those compensation. Clients. Yes, yes, <laughs> the, they're excellent for oil and gas law firms. Um, so, uh, you know, the incentive comp, right, I think that'll shift, uh, you know, better for oil field services, worse for the upstream uh, companies and for the, the oil market over time, but you'll see that shift back towards sort of more activity being rewarded. Um, but if there is insufficient activity and if that continues, that'll just result in much higher prices. And so you end up with demand being destroyed or suppressed through higher prices rather than being affected by uh, broader economic concerns. Gotcha. And so it is worth uh, noting to the extent that that does happen, if we see a reset in demand for much higher prices, uh, that is very, con that would be a, a scenario that'd be very concerning for the global economy. The yeah. last time that happened was in the middle of 2008. Oh, wow. Okay. Isn't it? Thanks for explaining this. So uh, OPEC um, does not have the spare capacity that they have said. Uh, interestingly, actually yesterday, at the World Economic Forum, the CEO of Saudi Aramco talked about how little spare capacity there is. Um, they cited a 2 million barrel uh, spare capacity number for the world and, and our numbers, uh, which were prepared prior to that interview, we had a 1.8 million barrel a day spare capacity estimate. So <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> we're within 0.2 million barrels a day of the spare capacity estimate that Aramco is now citing, which is pretty exciting because when we came out with our estimate a year and a half ago, it was quite contentious to, to forecast that there was almost no spare capacity. This 1.8 number is very important because when you look at the amount of demand recovery likely in China, which we're forecasting, let's say about 2 million barrels a day of demand recovery this year, um, there is not enough spare capacity to that. You mm -hmm. need world oil supply to grow in and outside of OPEC and world oil demand um, when you consider China growing and other parts of the world growing their oil demand um, there may be we may be in a material undersupply situation and there may not be enough spare capacity so there may be a true call on OPEC OPEC likely may not be able to deliver I think that's the reason for Aramco to sort of come clean on the actual uh, spare capacity estimates and they, they've been pretty consistent now talking about this for the last number of months, uh, both Aramco and uh, the Saudi energy minister talking about the need for additional uh, investment in oil development. And, you know, they're not asking for their competitors to come out and drill because they're feeling charitable. They're mm -hmm. asking for it because they don't want a situation in which there's a call on OPEC. OPEC is not able to deliver mm -hmm. and oil prices reset higher. That might sound good, for them, but it's actually quite bad because that will result in oil demand destruction. And then it probably also results in a dramatic sort of boom and bust situation, which is not great from their perspective for oil market stability. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> with that sort of bleak uh, background, it is helpful to think about sort of how much oil and gas stocks have underperformed versus the broader market uh, over the last 10 years. And in particular, small cap oil and gas stocks are still down roughly 70% from where they were in 2012 uh, versus the broader market, which is up 170% roughly. So, uh, and these are like numbers that are a few days old, but still sort of th this is uh, roughly correct. And so what's interesting is uh, oil and gas stocks, the large caps are up about 25%. Oil's down about 12% and the small caps are down about 70% in a situation where we see oil prices recover, 
and stay strong over a multi-year uh, period, it's reasonable to expect oil and gas equities to catch up with a broader market, which we've seen in every other past cycle. So this isn't reinventing the wheel, this isn't projecting something that hasn't happened before. Not only has it happened before, it's happened virtually every other oil bull market and every other similar scenario where there's been multiple years of underinvestment. So XLE has upside from that up 26% over the last decade. You know, maybe it will meet the S&P in the middle, maybe it'll catch up and the S&P will keep rising and XLE will rise even more, uh, but that would be roughly room for a double or a little more for large caps and mega cap oil and gas stocks. Um, the implied return to the extent that the S&P 500 does not fall, that it just stays flat or rises from here, the implied return for small caps, which are down materially, um, you know, they're, they're, it's just the numbers are astronomical. It's many, many times that they would have to trade up to be able to catch up with the broader market. And the interesting thing is when you look at past cycles, you've seen small caps do best. And so you sort of see this initial recovery for large caps, and then you see small caps take the lead. And this happens in other industries as well as in oil and gas, and it's happened in virtually every other cycle. So I think it's just a matter of time as people get more comfortable with oil prices not collapsing again, uh, being roughly sustainably high, as people get comfortable with Chinese demand recovering, as they get comfortable with there not being some new giant source of supply, I think it's reasonable to expect small cap oil and gas stocks to materially outperform and you know going from down 70 to up 170 uh <laughs> that's a you know what is a five to seven times type uh, return potential perhaps more so mm -hmm. again none of this is certain but when we look at past cycles and we look at the market dynamics uh, that's the potential that's relevant for your world and that's relevant for sort of the oil and gas industry because when small caps do well, small caps are where a lot of uh, oil and gas innovation has uh, has sort of uh, been, that's been the nexus of, of innovation. It's where, you know, uh, Mitchell Energy, they came out with uh, and, and uh, spent years figuring out multi-stage uh, fracking and um, especially for horizontal development in the Barnett. Um, and that's sort of where this whole shale boom came from. You sort of need the small caps to get good valuations in order to incentivize activity to the extent that this chart and what this chart indicates is right. Uh, you can see a real significant activity boom which would be great for uh, oil and gas law as well as for your clients. Sure. Another, so do you have an opinion on um, what hits first, the small cap operators or oil field services? Um, I, think, I think they're both doing quite well. I think right now there's probably more upside for the small cap producers. And I think there's a reasonable expectation, uh, at least from an onshore services perspective, that a revaluation in the onshore small cap producers leads to additional demand for oil field services. So if, if I were to project a sequencing, I, I would expect the sequencing to be the small cap producer equities rising substantially, that leading to that meaning a better cost of capital for those producers, allowing them to raise money, to spend more money, and the oil field services companies would be beneficiaries of that. But it's impossible to know the future right. and that may, may may play out differently. So um, this was an interesting chart uh, from our friends at uh, Oil and Gas uh, Private Equity Fund. They uh, let us uh, give us permission to use it. Um, one of the things we've been seeing is that as this cycle has progressed and after large cap oil and gas stocks materially outperformed small caps and after they, they got to a point where they were trading at much higher valuations than small caps, they started to buy small caps and started to buy private oil and gas companies um, in transactions that were massively accretive. And the market reaction has been very positive for the acquirers. And you can measure this based on the performance of the stocks versus um, their uh, indexes uh, over the time frame around the acquisitions. And so one of the other things that I think is worth noting on this is that there is a positive trajectory for uh, transaction valuations. So when you look at where things were transacting uh, middle of the year last year, you, you had uh, transactions sort of in that roughly two times EBITDA 
uh, and, and that's like a heuristic, it's not perfect, but it is somewhat indicative on other metrics on these transactions as well. Um, towards the end of last year, you saw transactions higher, you saw them closer to three, three and a half times EBITDA. So that's relevant if you're looking at, from my perspective, a small cap oil and gas producer that's publicly traded, that's trading at, let's say, two times EBITDA, there's a reasonable expectation that they sold um, that if the market's at three and a half times or three times that they might sell for the market price in a private transaction. Mm -hmm. So um, we thought we'd share one um, uh, investment idea um, just to sort of make this more tangible and to share sort of the high level, hey, the oil market looks very undersupplied uh, versus the specifics, okay, what's that mean? And, you know, uh, from a bison perspective, ultimately everything that we do leads to our investment decisions where we invest our client capital into uh, specific securities. And so we own Vital Energy, we're not recommending it. And, um, you know, if anyone is looking at investing in something like this, they should do their own due diligence and they should consult an advisor. Um, but I thought it'd be helpful to share this idea in the context. So we showed that the oil market is likely to be undersupplied, specifically because of the China reopening. We showed that oil and gas small cap equities are materially undervalued versus large cap oil and gas equities, and that both have lagged the broader uh, stock market. Um, and then we're showing this particular security. Oh, and we showed the transaction multiples where there's been an increase in transaction multiples, mostly on um, private assets getting bought by public companies that are larger, uh, but we think this is relevant. Um, and now we're showing this particular security, uh, this particular company that's trading at under two times EBITDA on consensus numbers for 2023. Um, they're actively buying back stock, paying down debt, and they're sort of hated. And uh, I guess at Bison, we've sort of gotten this reputation for finding things that are hated and considered to be terrible. And as they go from being perceived as terrible to less bad, the valuations tend to rise materially. And so this is a situation where they're trading at a large discount relative to their small cap peers. They're trading at an even larger discount relative to large cap peers. Um, and, you know, there's really substantial upside from our estimates, from various other, um, you know, sell side firms and industry consultants. And it's been sort of one of the sort of like battleground stocks. They, they just renamed themselves. They used to be called Laredo, mm -hmm. uh, Laredo Petroleum. And, uh, you know, it's one of these things where when you look at it, uh, people's reactions to it are pretty negative. Um, but the numbers aren't that bad mm -hmm. and they've paid down a ton of debt and they're likely to pay down a bunch more debt this year. And, uh, you know, they're sitting on um, a lot of oil and gas and they're really cheap. So when you think about a world where oil is undersupplied and you think about who wins and to your question of, hey, who wins the most? Um, companies like Vital, I almost called them Laredo, um, they are positioned to to just win substantially relative to their peers from higher oil. Well, I appreciate you sharing that idea with us, Josh. Absolutely. Here's Josh's contact information. Uh, should we take some questions? Sure, let's do it. Real quick, before we take any questions, I just want to ask, uh, you know, I understand that in addition to institutional and capital endowments, you also invest for individuals. So how should people get in touch with you? Um, yeah, so so again, none of this is a solicitation, um, but people can find us. I mean, the easiest thing is just to our website has to contact us. And right. so, you know, if it's relevant, great. But again, the goal here is uh, to just help share a market uh, perspective. And, and, and Josh and, and his team at Bison also put out excellent uh, monthly research pieces. They're monthly, right? Yeah. Yeah, monthly research pieces that you can subscribe on the website, bisoninterest.com. Uh, you also share them on Twitter and, and LinkedIn and everything. Yeah. So uh, let's go to some questions here. Josh, could you share your thoughts on used oil collection and recycling com companies with demand with demand high? Could that be a place to look? Um, yeah, I think those are interesting. I've seen companies engage in that business from a public equity perspective, and it's never. Uh, quite worked out how the companies have represented, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that um, that doesn't mean that it won't it won't work out. And so I guess it's just uh, going to be opportunity specific. 
what's your bear case for oil and gas? Where could things go wrong? I mean, like if there is a terrible global economic downturn, there is a real chance that in that sort of scenario, we could see much lower oil prices for a period of time. And I guess the, the nice thing about that from a multi-year perspective is even if that does happen, and even if we see much lower oil prices, that would be a setup for even higher prices and even more activity for even longer because we're in this capital deficit situation. There's not been enough exploration. There's not been enough delineation. There's not been enough development. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of short cycle shale development. We've done very little of the sort of longer life, longer cycle activity, and there's been very little exploration. So to the extent that we see a global economic downturn, we could see much lower oil prices for a period, and that would likely result again in much higher prices for even longer. Thanks, Josh. Um, I have a question about uh, supply chain, chain disruptions. How do supply chain disruptions continue to impact the industry, and do you have any advice on operators on how to na navigate these disruptions? And how does your, uh, would your advice change if you were giving the same advice to oil field service companies? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, I think we've moved from a scenario where, um, we moved from a scenario where uh, there were COVID era disruptions that were sort of specific to uh, China lockdowns that were specific to industrial and logistical disruptions from COVID lockdowns and, and similar. Um, I think we're, we're moving from that to a sort of more typical cyclical uh, sort of bottlenecks of labor, and we're seeing bottlenecks around uh, there just having been insufficient maintenance, insufficient construction activity, um, and uh, you know I think. I think we're going to see, if you remember from the past cycle, there was a minute where Guar was really uh, the, was really expensive, and there was a minute where, well, more than a minute where sand was really expensive. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just, it, it is sort of interesting to see how everyone discovers, oh, we need this thing that no one's invested in for 10 years because there was overinvestment in the last cycle, and then suddenly mm -hmm. there's a shortage and people are willing to pay whatever they can for a particular input. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I would expect much less of the COVID era disruptions and much more of specific disruptions related to underinvestment and lower than sort of maintenance level activities uh, across, across the space. I don't think it would change for oil field services. I think actual oil field services has been experiencing uh, more challenging disruptions than the upstream uh, companies. And so I think the companies are aware of it. Their cost of capital is still way too high mm -hmm. to generally make it worth investing to sort of solve those problems mm -hmm. fully. And so as those equities rise, as their margins rise and their revenues rise, um, I would expect them to be spending capital to address those issues. But, um, you know, like Schlumberger started to address that and they talked about a real significant capital uh, capex increase on their last uh, conference call, and mm -hmm. you know I would expect more of that going forward. Even with their step up, we we pulled the slide out. Probably should have kept it. Um, oil field services capex has been hit even worse than upstream capex. So there's there's going to be a lot of spend that's necessary over a long time, and that's actually part of what has us so bullish from a multi-year perspective on oil. Um, you don't just need the upstream companies to start spending more money or wanting to spend more money, they need to be able to have services available to spend it on. Mm -hmm. And if the ups, if the oil food services companies still have too high a cost of capital to invest, to have the physical capacity to have the labor available for those upstream companies to allow them to spend it, you, know, you sort of have first, first you need the upstream companies to have the money, and then you need the oil food services companies to have the capacity mm -hmm. and it's not a sort of linear and not an instant solution to the problem. Interesting. Sounds like a truly a situation where people need to work together to come up with solutions. Yeah, and frankly, it's just going to be money and time that yeah. solves it. Um, Joe asks, are institutional investors warming up to more substantial investments in oil and gas despite increasing ESG pressure? We're still not seeing it. It's okay. amazing. We're still seeing money leaving the space. 
we're still seeing private equity selling and then the institutional capital that's pulled out from that not being fully reinvested back in the space. Um, one uh, country that we haven't talked about is India. And Carrie asked a question, uh, Josh, it's not your focus, but any idea on how to play India and its monster need for oil and gas in the future? Yeah, so India is actually a really big, uh, so China, their sort of organic demand growth is probably slowing down. India is, is not slowing down, it's actually been accelerating. And so the absolute numbers for China are bigger, and that's why I've been focused on it uh, for this presentation, as well as just in our, our general research. Um, India over time, if you look, let's say 10 years out from now, if you get back to that sort of normalized, let's say 16 million barrels a day demand for China, from there, Chinese demand probably doesn't grow at that rapid of a pace. It probably grows at a slower pace than it grew over the prior 10 years. Mm -hmm. India probably grows pretty aggressively over the next 10 years. So if you looked at the growth rate, India will be a bigger driver on a percentage basis than China mm -hmm. over the next 10 years. Um, frankly, their population is also still growing, whereas China's population is starting to shrink. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the way to play it from my perspective is just general exposure to oil and gas. I don't think there's, um, from, from what I've seen, there are some oil and gas fields in India, but it's not the most, let's say, promising environment for exploration and development. Um, and so what that means is that you need more oil and more natural gas coming from other places. And so um, same sort of idea, I think, as addressing the general oil market. Yeah. Um, yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article that talked about uh, Russia's energy policy and how they misjudge the situation between or the conflict between Russia and Ukraine with respect to uh, their actions in the energy industry. And Richard asked the question is, do you see Russia being able to continue to produce with their price cap? It's a great question. I mean, I thought, I, I think if you asked me uh, a little less than a year ago, so after the invasion and after some of the announcements of sanctions and so on, I would have thought that by now we'd have about a million barrels a day less of Russian production coming onto the market. And right now we have a few hundred thousand barrels a day less, not a million barrels mm -hmm. a day less. So, so far I've been wrong. Um, <laughs> so having been wrong, I'll prognosticate that <laughs> we're gonna lose a little more production from there, but not a lot. And the reality is that there's just the consumers of oil want oil enough, and there are various consumers that are that are large enough consumers, particularly India and China, that um, there there are, there are large enough consumers that are willing to buy Russian oil that it doesn't seem to be limiting their their production and supply. I think the bigger factor there is that some of the Russian fields are quite technically complicated. And while they were able to get, let's say, Sockman 1 back on production after a number of months of it being off, um, I would expect additional fields to have technical issues. And to the extent that sanctions are continued and maybe taken to a little bit more, uh, pushed a little further, um, I would expect there to be production issues in Russia over time. I think new sanctions hit today. Or yeah. Go live today in Russia. I think so too. Yeah. And then also there's going to be a refined product export ban. Um, at the or import ban in the EU from, right. from Russia uh, starting in early February. But even with all that, it seems like the solution has been just to load stuff on boats and send it to China and India. Continuing around the world, uh, Lucas asks, can any country repeat the scenario of Mexico where the lack of investment and depletion of easily available reserves ends as a drastic drop in production? Yes, um, I think we're we're seeing um, I think we're seeing that happen in a number of different countries. Nigeria was actually uh, a pretty interesting surprise last year with much lower oil production than consensus. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a good chance that we see that going forward. I don't really want to speculate on specific countries <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Uh, but yeah, I think that is happening. Um, that gets offset to some extent by increased production in countries like Guyana, where Exxon and Hess have been ramping up their development. Um, but I think, I think the right proxy for that um, is that when you look at the amount of money spent over the last 10 years, it's been 
falling a lot, and especially on the exploration and delineation side, it's been way lower than it was in the 10-year period before that. And so that's just an indication that old fields are not being replaced. So there's various ways of measuring it. The easiest way, from my perspective, just looking at inflation-adjusted capital spend. Mm. And so with low inflation-adjusted capital spend over the last number of years, you just you you know that there are going to be more of these sort of Mexico Cantorell type problems, um, and you know that there's going to be a supply challenge for the next number of years. Mm. Also, a good question. Can you please share your favorite oil and gas books? So I think there's a there's an easy one which is the frackers. I mm -hmm. think uh, you sort of catch it was like so well written that you actually catch some of the excitement of the shale oil boom mm -hmm. in the early chapters, and then some of the sort of sadness and uh, challenges in the final chapters as they talk about uh, some of the struggles in the bust and uh, you know some of the personal struggles that that men like Aubrey McClendon had after uh, some of their their uh, initial success was almost too successful and they ended up flooding the market mm -hmm. for natural gas. Um, what's something that didn't go as well as you expected in 2022 for the industry? Uh, Russia sanctions. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think, uh, I think it's interesting uh, that's sort of a cop out, right? Uh, the, the, the real sort of industry problem, I think, is that uh, well productivity has pretty much stopped rising in the US. And there was an expectation that advances in technology and that improvements in uh, drilling efficiency would have led to continued uh, increases in well productivity like we discussed earlier, and that did not happen. And so I think from an industry perspective, that was a big disappointment. I think it was more of a surprise for some than for others, but I think it's reasonable to expect that to continue this year. And, um, you know, I think there are many who may be disappointed by continued um, continued shale productivity disappointments. Hmm. I have uh, two more questions. The first question is, you mentioned that capital has not been returning from large institutional investors to the industry as was expected um, in the last year. So where does the capital for this significant investment that needs to happen uh, moving forward come from? That is a great question. I think you need higher prices to incentivize capital to return to the industry. Right. So some of it is that the producers are making a lot of money and the, the, if, if, they're, if they're able to generate high enough returns, they'll redirect some of the capital from share buybacks, debt pay down, um, and dividends, they'll redirect some of that towards development if the returns are high enough. But the returns are high enough there, the biggest market factor for that is price. Mm -hmm. So higher price will pull capital that direction. And that was successful to some extent. You could see that last year, sort of mid-year after prices had run from 70 or so at the start of the year to a peak of 130 or so. At, as that run happened, you started to see more rigs getting absorbed and getting used, more drilling happening. Without that sort of price impetus, it's hard to see where that next leg comes from, from an industry perspective. And from an outside capital perspective, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Like, it, it almost seems like institutions are lining up to generate worse returns for their beneficiaries right now. Still, so, I mean, you're still seeing more allocation towards venture, more allocation towards tech and the growth, large cap stocks. And, you know, we have seen periods like this before. And, you know, the idea of buying something because the price is down a little is, I think, intuitive, but it's not really value investing if you're buying something that was at like 50 times revenue and now is at 10 times or 12 times revenue. If it doesn't generate free cash flow, if it doesn't have sort of basic business business characteristics that fundamental investors would find attractive, um, you know, in the end, you need someone else to buy it from you if a yeah. company can't pay you a dividend or buy back stock. And so, um, I think we're still we're still at the tail end of a epic technology and venture capital bubble, right. and so we're still seeing. I think we're seeing people chasing that 
mm -hmm. and pulling capital away from areas that are actually generating positive cash flow. Um, so the last question that I have is, uh, what are bright spots? It's in a, a positive note. What are the bright spots for the industry in 2023? So, I mean, Guyana is phenomenal. Suriname is, is uh, that's part of that trend. Sure. It's, it's great. Um, Canadian uh, oil fields are actually seeing some productivity improvements, which is exciting. It's a much smaller uh, production base, particularly on the unconventional side than the U.S., but there have been some really promising and interesting developments there. Um, actually, interestingly, using old technologies, but uh, fishbone design wells and multilaterals from a single well bore, where some wells they drill down and they'll have eight laterals coming out from one well bore. Wow. Um, yeah, so, and, and that's actually a pretty old technology. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it might have originally been in California or Texas where, where that was sort of innovated uh, decades ago. And so um, they're, they're successfully applying those technologies. So I think, uh, I think there's really room for significant innovation. And I think from an industry perspective, it would be really healthy to see that. And I think we're going to start to see the next leg up from an oil field innovation perspective this year. Well, in some uh, aspects, it, maybe it's, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but lack of capital sometimes can drive innovation too. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I think this sort of environment where labor is tight, services are tight, cash flows are improving, valuations are not phenomenal. I think that's the sort of scenario where you're gonna see some innovation start to happen. And that's where I don't think it's dire, right? I think, I think we're really in an undersupplied situation. I think prices likely rise materially, but I am optimistic. I think that the industry will answer the call. I think people will figure out sort of the next technical solutions to be able to get the supply that the world needs. Mm -hmm. It's just going to take time mm -hmm. and it's going to take money. And so that has me bullish on oil and gas equities. It has me bullish on oil as a commodity on a multi-year basis. Um, but it also, I do think that this cycle like past cycles will end and we just need to see a lot of capital spent in between now and the many years from now when it does end. Great. Well, Josh, I really appreciate uh, the time that you spent with us here today. Everybody, thank you so much for attending. Uh, we had a few hundred folks watch this. So I appreciate everyone uh, spending your Thursday afternoon with us, Wednesday afternoon, sorry. And uh, please find Josh on Twitter, sign up for his newsletter, look for him on the news. He's everywhere these days. Josh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.